Hi class, I apologize for not being able to be there today in person. As I mentioned in my email, I have a little bit of a sore throat, so I'll do my best to give this brief lecture on the evolution of Tango. So I want to talk about and focus on some of the changes in the music and in the dance, and I'll be providing you little clips. And as I mentioned before, the origins of Tango come from the African Congo region, Sahara Africa. And so in the mid to late 19th century, the Africans would have these large carnivals, and that's where uh, Tango used to be pl played and danced uh, in these like large carnivals, like the way we know in um, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And so, uh, so this is where people would first hear the tango, they hear the candombe drums and so forth. And so then when immigration, European immigration occurred in the late 19th century, we had in the 1880s and 1890s, immigrants lived in sort of the, the projects, the slums of Buenos Aires. And so they had these thick cobblestone streets. And so they would dance this type of tango. <laughs> So we can see here how their feet sort of pick up a lot and there's lots of playfulness and there isn't that many fancy moves. They're not really pivoting because they used to dance on these thick cobblestones that, was, that were terrible for pivoting. And then in the 1910s, as I mentioned before, the tango went to Paris, France, and that's when it received sort of social approval from the elites. And when it returned to Buenos Aires, then it became acceptable to dance it, for the upper echelons to dance it. But we see in the music and the dance, it's still very basic, very childlike. The rhythm is very simple, very easy to find. So let me show you a clip here from a, a movie. So we have here the embrace is close there, similar to the last dance you just saw, which was called Kanshenge, forgot to mention that. But it, in this dance, it's also close to embrace. But we see the change in, in attire. Again, this is more of the social elites dancing tango. And uh, the music is just really simple. It's like you can hear the dominant beat very clearly, nothing really fancy going on in the dance. There's that uh, cabaseo there. <laughs> okay, so let's continue now. So we now have in the 1920s, the medium of film becoming more and more popular. And once again, film, the film industry starting in Paris, France, and we see featured in film scenes of tango, but the classic Latin lover, and you see sort of the image of the, the woman sort of in distress and needing to um, be adored, needing to be saved by the man. So let me show you here a simple scene. This is a silent film and so the first actual talkie, so a movie with sound, wasn't until 1927 with the debut of the jazz singer. But we have here Rod Rodolfo Valentino and he was this uh, sort of like Tom Cruise of the era and uh, this Latin lover and, and that's how he was sort of celebrated and featured and so dancing the tango became associated with passion through the medium of film. And we also see in the 1920s the singer featured and so you've heard this song in tango class on Friday. <laughs> Oh, 
So the singer is highlighted, it's sort of more central than the actual beat. And then you have in the 1930s the king of the beat, king of the compas, and that's Juan D'Arienzo. And I've shared this brief video, and this is when Juan D'Arienzo basically tells the singer, you sit down, you need to go and take a back seat, and I'm gonna bring the bandanones. We're gonna bring rock and roll to tango. So this music was extremely popular. It brought young dancers onto the dance floor. The beat was steady and clear. There was no confusion. It's high energy, very energetic. So let me share with you a clip of two dancers dancing to Darienzo. Of course, this is a more contemporary piece, but you get a sense of just how playful the dance can be. Again, this is Juan D'Arienzo, the same guy you saw in that black and white uh, film. And pay attention to her feet, just how fast it's moving. She's just hitting all those little beats. And it's like her feet are on fire, like she's dancing on coal, and she's just constantly keeping her feet sort of snapping and moving it against that hot floor. And again, this is all improvised. None of this is orchestrated. That strong beat that you hear is the bandanion. It's very, very clear. You can watch them uh, dance all day. So then you had sort of evolve was in the 1940s, you start to see orchestras like Pugliese. And Pugliese's style of music was morose and pensive. It was basically the type of dance and music for the adults, right? So we see this evolution starting uh, Tango as a Child in the 1910s, kind of become a teenager in the 1920s, and it's all about romance and love and having crushes. 1930s, it starts to become an adult and it's dancing and going crazy. And then 1940s, it's sort of, uh, you're putting down the uh, wine coolers and beer and you're bringing out the whiskey. Okay, so you see this maturity occur in the music as well in the dance. So let me show you a clip here of what it looks like. <laughs> This type of uh, music, it's almost like you, you want to watch, but like you're in the windowsill of something going on inside of someone's house. So it's very intimate, very intense. So oftentimes when uh, this type of music comes, turns on or comes on, then uh, the advanced dancers come onto the floor and the beginners take a seat and watch their teachers dance. All right, so let's move on. And now we have in the 1950s. So remember 1955 is when you had a dictatorship come in and start censoring and banning certain types of tango music. And then you also had rock and roll from the United States becoming more and more popular. So the teenagers at the time wanted to dance to Elvis and the Beatles, not to their parents' music. 
Then you had the another dictatorship come in 1976, and so you had what was called the Dirty War. So there were seven long years of uh, liberals and progressive being kidnapped and murdered, and uh, and so there was no dongle, no public uh, gatherings at that time. But in 1983, dongle returned to the scene, and once again it went to Paris, and once again it got the seal of approval. And so what you start to see occur in the 1990s and the 2000s, what was called Tango Nuevo. So let me show you a little bit of what this looks like. It's always on Sunday, uh, special night. So we have here the embrace is open. They seldom ever go chest to chest. Um, you also have a lot more sort of freedom in the woman's body. And again, she's improvising. And what you start to see in the late 90s and 2000s is more agency from the female dancers. Many of them have been trained in ballet, modern dance or folkloric. And uh, so they come to the dance with their own skill sets. So they're not there to just follow, to just be a puppet. They bring something to the dance as well. Uh, they're also um, more athletic as well. Um, and there's a certain sense of sort of grace and style to their dance that you didn't see in the earlier generations of the dance in the 30s and 40s which was dominated mostly by, by males. All right, let's move on. So I have here a clip of another example there of uh, the dance in the 1990s and 2000s. But we also start to see in the 2000s the queer tango movement um, take place. And so this is when we start to see um, men dancing with other men and traveling and giving tours with other men. So in the late 19th century and early 20th century, men used to dance together and it was done for the purpose of practice. And so oftentimes, not always, but tango was danced at the brothels. And so, and brothels would provide entertainment for the patrons while they're waiting their turn to see a prostitute. So, it was considered a great honor to be good enough as a dancer to be able to dance with like some of these women in the brothels. So men would practice with other men to be able to be in the good favor of some of these women. And it really wasn't until the 1990s and 2000s when you saw um, men starting to openly dance and and perform and teach together. So this one particular couple, Martin and Mariso, Mauricio, um, are a couple from Europe. I uh, took taking lessons with them. They're great, super super fun to uh, take lessons from. Um, you also see, as I've shown before, uh, female teachers as well. And this doesn't start to take place until the recently, like in the last. 10 years, have you seen female um, dancers start to tour together just literally just before the pandemic um, for the first time I've seen uh, two female teachers, two famous dancers decide to tour together. And so this is still, it's still quite chauvinistic um, where there's still this expectation that if you're going to teach and compete and dance and perform that you need a male dance partner. So we still have a lot of work to, to do to change people's uh, assumptions about this particular dance. Let's move on. And then you have in the, also in the 2010s, the uh, dance called Dango Salon, and uh, it's very similar to the examples I've been giving before. 
And tango salon is basically social tango. It's what we dance in the various tango events. And uh, it's close embrace, chest to chest. In this particular song, it's more pensive. And the slower the tango becomes, the more advanced it is. The more challenging it is to like really, really listen to that music and really, really connect with your partner. This is one of my favorite teachers and dancers. Uh, it's it's like they're moving in water. And that's what it would feel like dancing with these two people. Um, this female dancer is the same dancer I just showed you a second ago. She was the one leading. Uh, she's a, an amazing, amazing dancer. All right, let me come to a close end. And then we have, in recent years, in the last 10 years, Tongo being used in clinics to help treat Alzheimer's patients as well as uh, Parkinson's patients. It's also being used in couples therapy. And, uh, and then also recently we see Tango for Social Justice. So we see um, festivals like Tango Embra. We see more musicians uh, writing music about feminism, about uh, trans identity. We see more um, Tango musicians and dancers speaking out against femicide and domestic violence. In the year that I was in Buenos Aires, I competed in the world, world, um, the world championships. Uh, in really, it's an open competition where anybody can sign up. So it's, it sounds impressive that I participated, but really anybody can sign up for it. So. Um, but the, some of the semi-finalists, there was a Russian couple where the husband punched his wife in, for making a mistake during their performance and it was witnessed and so fortunately they disqualified the Russian couple for, um, for what occurred and so it, it was the first time that the Tango organization sort of set a standard for what was, a, you know, what was not going to be permitted. And um, domestic violence and femicide is a serious problem in Latin America. Uh, so it was uh, a large gesture for sure for the organization to disqualify this couple. And it um, doesn't say much, of course, uh, about what occurred with this couple back home in Russia. So. That's something that we cannot know. But we see more and more often Tango being used as a platform to uh, speak up against various social injustices. Okay, so I'm gonna end our, uh, this presentation here. And uh, the next step is for you to complete a brief quiz, brief comprehension quiz uh, about this uh, presentation. Thank you.